I'd like to introduce our presenter. His name is Jeff Chernyak. Chernyak. Uh, Jeff has given permissions, pres excuse me, presentations on both the First and Second World Wars, subjects that have held his interest and has fascinated him since the age of 10 to the present. Jeff has visited historical sites in both the Pacific and European theaters, such as Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, RAF fighter airfields in England, the Normandy beaches in France, the Plashoff and Auschwitz-Birkenau German concentration camps in Poland. And now, here's Jeff. First off, I'd like to thank the vets. I know there's some vets in the room here. God bless you. Thank you for your service. And I'd like to thank the audience for attending today's presentation. Um, questions, if you have any questions, please hold them until the very end. I'd appreciate it. All right, here we go. These booklets, I will be going through them page by page, and you can follow along as we move along. Now, we're going to have a raffle at the end of the show. That's why we have the uh, propaganda who tweeted. This book is up for this one, and this these two books are up to be raffled off. All right, so someone's going to win a book. First off, I'd like to mention the fact this flag. This is an original. Who could tell me what's different about this one? Forty-eight stars. Got it. I love that flag. All right. To start off, I'm going to do a little bit of information before America's involvement. And it started with these guys attacking my father's homeland in 1939. My father was 11 when he was uh, taken from his homeland. And he would wear something like this. Germans like to label people. And here we go. First off, Revenue Act of 1940 decreased exemptions, increased individual tax rates and corporate rates, temporarily increased most excise tax rates 30 to 50 percent. September, look at that, the first peacetime draft begins. Back in Europe, we have nations falling left and right. Of course, Poland's already out of the picture. Now keep in mind, the Soviets took the other portion of Poland. Some people don't know that. They thought it was just maybe Germans taking it. Then, Norway. Denmark, Norway, the Low Countries, Netherlands, and Belgium, and France was taken. All in 1940. And of course, the Battle of Britain begins. And I could do another show on that alone. 1941. Revenue Act of 1941 decreased exemptions, permanently extended the temporary individual corporate and excise tax increases of 1940, increases the excise profits tax by 10%, and increased corporate tax rates 6 to 7 percentage points. Lend lease. Now, I'm going to be really hitting upon this later on in detail. But right now, as you can see, United Kingdom got the lion's share, and the, and the USSR got the second most. So, so that, I'm going to really mention that later. By the way, England paid off their war debt in 2006. Now, Lend-Lease, this provided any nation weapons and supplies the president deemed vital to the defense of the United States. FDR once said if your neighbor's house was on fire, you would lend him a hose. Right? Roosevelt would proclaim the U.S. as the arsenal of democracy. Victory Gardens started to spring up across the land. Now, a little side note. FDR was having a tough time starting up the war machine because of his New Deal regulations 
and his taxes were hurting the growth of war production, so he decided to privatize. And then production went through the roof. Here's an example. Henry J. Kaiser, an American industrialist who was considered the father of mo modern shipbuilding. He operated seven major shipyards on the West Coast, and they were called Kaiser Shipyards. He desperately needed workers because most of them went to the aircraft building industry. How he obtained those workers is through giving them health care at 80 cents a week. How many of you heard of Kaiser Healthcare? There you go. Concluding with a victory tax, first of seven war loans drives begin, otherwise known as war bonds after December 7th. Concluding with a victory loan drive in October of 45, over the course of war, 85 million Americans would purchase war bonds totaling approximately $185 billion. Now, who can tell me when the war ended? September 45. And as you can see, victory loan drives are being had even in October after the war ended. So that's something to talk about. This is cool because here's an example of a 10 cent war savings stamp album. You fill it up to $18.75, turn it in for a war savings bond on the right here, wait 10 years, and it becomes 25 bucks. Meanwhile, back in Europe, Germany invades the Balkans. Romania and Hungary were on Germany's side at the time, but the rest of them, Albania, Bulgaria, all the way down to Greece, Yugoslavia, Rommel lands in North Africa, continuing with his African campaign all the way out towards Egypt. Now on June 22nd of 1941, Hitler invades the Soviet Union. Now who could tell me the name of the operation Hitler coined that operation's name? You know it, Mike. Barbarossa. Very good. There we go. What Hitler's objectives were, we have up here. Oh, I'm not going to be able to see it. All right, that's, that's all right. right. That's okay. Okay, cool. I'll just bring it over there. Leningrad, Moscow up here, and then Stalingrad. All right. He doesn't get anywhere near any of these right there. Any of these objectives. On December 6th, the German army is at the gates of Moscow. They're within 19 miles of city center. All right. Everybody knows what this is, right? Yeah. What is it? Is stick grenade? Yes. Do you know how it was operated? Yeah, so you unscrew the bottom, and then there's a little string. You pull it, and then you throw it quick. Very good. Awesome. Give him a gold star. Awesome. Just some of them have different key signings. Very nice. I like that. He's, uh, hats off, if I had a hat. Very nice. Yes, good, good, good. Okay, so they're practically on Moscow, and it's December 6th. What happens tomorrow? Got it. I'm a board gamer, so I use my bo game boards towards my uh, presentation. Here we have the Pacific. Forget Russia now. That's another, that's another thing. So, what we have, turning to that page, Pearl Harbor. As you can see, the aircraft that were involved in this attack, this would be known as a zero fighter. These are all carrier, aircraft carrier based aircraft. All right. And the, they launched like 150 miles north of Oahu on the December 7th. Here is a Valdai bomber. 
Here is a Kate torpedo bomber. Okay. The ordnance. Notice. Here's an actual picture that I took when I was out in Pearl Harbor. They listed all the weapons that they dropped on the ships and the airfields mm. and the army barracks. And this little child was standing there. I said, per perfect for scale. So I took the picture. And you notice the wooden fins. Now, excuse me, what is your name? Chase. Chase. Do you know why they put the wooden fins on the torpedoes? Okay, good, good. Did they explode? Yes, because Pearl Harbor was so shallow, when they put those wooden fins on there, when they dropped the torpedoes from the aircraft, they would rise back up to the surface because otherwise they would sink right to the bottom of the harbor. All right, so that would bring them right up, and the dev devastation was complete. Now, here's a little sample of what I've created here. Here we have... These are the battleships that were actually in the in the harbor the day of, all right? Another little game piece here I have. And these, all of them were damaged. Four of them were sunk. The red dot ones were sunk, Arizona, Oklahoma. The West Virginia and California were also sunk, but were, would be raised later on, and we'll talk about that battle later on, and they'll be used. Now, the aircraft carriers... The, Right here is the, the number of Japanese battleships. So we're really outnumbered now. All right, we still have more battleships on the wet east coast. But, um, and down here we have the aircraft carriers. And I'll explain those dots later on. But they have like six major aircraft carriers. We have like five, okay? And we'll hold on to them as best we can because it was all about aircraft carriers and the projection of air power in the Pacific. And there's some light carriers and stuff like that. So, as you can see, the casualty list, we suffered a lot. Japan hardly suffered anything. Now, what was missing in the harbor? Chase, what was missing in the harbor that the Japanese really wanted to destroy? No, they had the battleships. They had the battleships. They wanted the aircraft carriers. Okay. And there were none present. So that was crucial. <laughs> Similar to like the aircraft carrier down in New York Harbor, the Essex. Oh, Intrepid. But it's the Essex class. There you go. And then we have when Admiral Halsey, Bulldog Halsey, one of our greatest admirals, shows up with his carrier task force, which was only one carrier at the time, a day or two after the attack, here was his quote, upon seeing the destruction, before we're through with them, the Japanese language will only be spoken in hell. Mm. Payback time, exactly. All right. Japanese also went, ran amok coming down the peninsula towards Malaysia, taking Singapore, not all at this time period, attacking the Philippines right here, taking out Guam, and where is it? Wake Island. Right. Of course, the map's a little skewed, but it has all the necessary islands. Germany would declare war on December 11th. Hitler never conferred with any of his commanders in regards to this declaration. And America and Hitler were actually fighting a war in the Atlantic for quite some time. And so Hitler just put the dot on the I and declared war. During that month of December, Hitler went to his U-boat commander, Admiral Dernitz, submarines, okay, and said to him, I need subs off America's coast ASAP. Dernitz could only give him six. 
But over that next six months, nine months actually, of the war with America off the East Coast would sink a staggering 609 merchant and tanker vessels, totaling 3.1 million tons in just 184 patrols. Here's an example of U-boat, merchant ship, tanker. All right, Blind Tigers. Here we are on page five. As a side note in regards to this, the formation of this unit, President Roosevelt signed an unpublished executive order to create this unit in April of 1941. 1942, home front, scrap drives. Look at that, rationing. They did a great job. Everybody started to pitch in. Did you know that the rubber and aluminum could not be recycled that they collected through these scrap drives? Only virgin aluminum could be used to create aircraft. The technology at the time couldn't extract the impurities. Yeah. So it was kind of like a morale boosting kind of like effort. During the, the siege of Bataan, it's not shown on this map, but I'll show it to you on another map a little later on. Well, I'll show it to you right now. Here's the map. These are the central islands of the Philippines, and I'll get to this later, because you know I'm going to be talking about Leyte Gulf. But here's, right here is Bataan, and here's Manila. All right? The Americans were all forced down to, into this little peninsula. During that siege, due to the growing food crisis during the siege, a Milky Way candy bar would try to be sold for $37.50. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's outrageous. Outrageous. Bataan would fall. Some 35,000 American and Filipino prisoners would be taken north, marching on what was known as the Death March, 65 miles north. POW camps. All right, Doolittle Raid. I don't know if anybody's heard about that. This was a fantastic raid. It's all spelled out there, so I'm not going to cover it. Everybody can read that. But there was a secret base that Roosevelt told his, told the press where the aircraft landed in China. Does anybody know the name of that secret base? called Shangri-La. Yeah. Coral Sea, first naval battle where opposing fleets didn't spot each other other than with aircraft, thus the birth of the aircraft carrier and the, the importance of it. They stopped. Let me show you this. The Americans in the Battle of Coral Sea, they stopped the Japanese. What they wanted to do, right, can you see? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, cool. What they wanted to do, the Japanese were moving down the islands of the Solomons, and they're trying to come around here to take this base called Port Moresby. And the Americans stopped them cold in the Battle of Coral Sea. They lost a, the Japanese lost a, um, a light carrier, and we lost a major carrier, the, uh, Lexington. But that was their first stop, first upset in the Pacific. May 6th. Corregidor Falls, and again, it's not shown, oh, I don't know, I forgot to put it on the map there. Anyway, it's right in the heart of Manila Bay, and that ends the Pacific Campaign. Now, a lot of people are, maybe not, everyone heard of the Battle of Midway? Mm -hmm. Okay, very important battle, okay? And what happened there, four aircraft carriers were sunk. And it stopped Japan's expansion into the Pacific. They were trying the, for the island of Midway, right there. And it stopped them cold. Now, some say, oh, that's the turning point. I don't believe it's the turning point. Everyone's played chess, right? 
when you there you go when you put the king in danger what are you doing you're putting him in got it check exactly this was a check on the Japanese expansionism in the Pacific now the significance about the losses okay they lost four aircraft carriers thus the four red tacks about above the Japanese carriers they only had two left two major carriers left more on the way but but what they didn't lose and I have it documented in the sheet there is the air crews that's so significant because those the air crews 110 out of 480 were lost the rest of them what 370 are going to get recycled back into the Japanese military whether it be land-based attacks and so forth so right now I believe that's a check right and I'll explain what checkmate is in a second so at this time Japan was moving south and they're moving towards this place called Guadalcanal, all right? And it's significant because looking at this, if they take Guadalcanal, they could project air power throughout the rest of the Pacific and to cut off Australia because they've already owned all these lands. They've already conquered all these lands. So they're trying to isolate Australia from America's help, all right? And the strategy that they came up with is MacArthur, based down in Australia, would come up through and take these islands in the Solomons and move up through New Guinea and eventually head towards the Philippines. Meanwhile, Nimitz would sail up with his forces and then sweep across the Pacific. All right, and he was headed for Formosa. And we'll see who gets what first. At the same time, Japan, naturally, is moving south along and this is known as the Owen Stanley Ridge. So the Japan's moving along New Guinea. Meanwhile, they're moving down through the um, Solomons. And the old Japanese proverb said, he who chases two hares catches neither. Okay. The turning point, I believe, and I'll, get, I'll state my case behind that, is Guadalcanal. It's named after a village in the province of Seville, Spain. It's shaped like Jamaica, but half in its size and area. The island is divided by a mountain range. To the south, the mountains run straight into the sea, similar to the west coast of the island of Oahu. Who's ever been there? You'll know how steep that is. Making it useless for trade or war. To the north, flatter lands divided by rivers, great for agriculture and airfields. There you go. And now we're on the Guadalcanal page. Japanese forces landed a surveying team on June 8th. Started to construct an airfield in July of 42. America has to react. Seven naval battles will be fought over this island, two of them being carrier battles. Now, does anybody know of this individual right here? Medal of Honor winner. John Bassalone. Highlighted in the, and what is that, HBO? The Pacific. All right. Born in Buffalo, New York, moved to Raritan. And his statue is down in Raritan. I saw it. It's beautiful. What an honor to a great hero. And we'll know more about him later. All right. These five gentlemen. Who are they? Oldham Brothers. Got it. I'm going to read it a little bit here. All five of these brothers were on board the light cruiser USS Juno. It was damaged in a nighttime surface engagement while attempting repairs the next day. It was torpedoed and sunk by a Japanese sub. 700 men were lost, including all five Sullivan brothers. All right. Only 10 men survived this travesty. The weapons used in the Guadalcanal campaign and throughout the Solomons were 
their primary weapon was the long lance torpedo. And here's an example on the bottom. Here's the Japanese long lance torpedo, and here's the typical Mark 14 torpedo. You could see a Mark 14 on uh, out in front of the VFW on Route 208 in New Paltz. Yeah, see that? So, the significance behind the Japanese long lance torpedo was it was liquid oxygen filled. That meant it never left a wake, so you could never see it coming at you. And the explosive warhead was devastating. Blow off bows of ships, sink them outright, break them in half. And now, here I have my reason why I say Guadalcanal is the turning point in the war. Here are the losses. We had them all laid out. It looks like it's almost pretty even. America lost more in its naval element in manpower, but Japan lost. And I noted it here, approximately 1,200 pilots. Japanese air crew losses were primarily among their, most, their top quality and best trained personnel. So whatever was taken from, saved from Midway was brought to the Guadalcanal campaign, which ended on February 9th, 1943, squandered away to only be lost against the great American forces. Unstoppable at this point now. Only in late 43 did Japan start to train pilots in much greater numbers. Now this is really going to hurt them later on, and I got details on that. Here we go. Revenue Home Front Revenue Act of 1942 decreased exemptions, including on dependents, increased individual income tax rates, increased corporate tax rates. A 5% victory tax was created on all Individual incomes over $624 with a post-war credit. The act also created deductions for medical expenses. A lot happening in America right now. At this time, America was building up its strength in England for the eventual launch across the channel. Although they were very close allies, some animosity persisted. English would say of the Americans, they were overpaid, oversexed, and over here. An American's response to that was, <clears throat> they, the English, were underpaid, undersexed, and under Eisenhower. So that was a little dig. I like that. That was pretty cool. All right. The Allies invade North Africa. They land over here. Americans land at Morocco, the British land over here, all along here. What they're trying to do is race this way because Monty, on the other side, and his 8th Army are moving in from Egypt this way. So what they're trying to do is catch them, and they're going to catch them in Tunisia. Rommel and his vaunted Africa Corps. January of 43, America begins its air campaign against Germany and air forces, the 8th and 9th, operated out of England, as you can see right here, all right. The RAF also operated out of England, and when America finally gets into Italy, they're going to launch airstrikes to Germany and points anywhere it wants to from the 15th Air Force. Now I'm going to show you another game board. Here's an example, another game board, but as you can see, I can, well I can walk out a little bit there. As you can see, you got the oil refineries, you have the industries, you have the air bases, and you have the aircraft industries. And then the airfields are in red. All right. All of these targets were bombed by the RAF and the American Air Force until the rubble bounced. They got the job done. By early 
1944, 41% of the German resources went into air defense because of the Allied bombings. This clearly enabled the Russian army, once again, to wage a successful war against the Germans. So now they're getting Lend-Lease, and then we're helping them out with the air, air forces bombing German industries and causing mayhem. There was a man named Air Chief Marshal Sir Bomber Harris, and he once said, he was in charge of the RAF, he once said, if you want to destroy something, you got to destroy everything. primary bombers that the 8th Air Force or all the Air Forces used was the B-17. This is a model of the Memphis Bell, okay, built when I was a kid. So. 12,731 were built during the war on short range, 400 miles or less, they can carry a payload of 8,000 pounds. Long range, 800 miles, their payload was reduced to 4,500 pounds. And the price of one of these would be $238,329 per plane. That was then. I don't know what it would be now. I got to look into that. So. All right. Battle of Kasserine Pass. Happens like around this area right here. The Americans got their first taste of what Rommel was like. And they didn't like it. This is the primary weapon they used. This is a Sherman tank. This is a little bit upscaled model of it. Did anybody see that movie Fury? Yeah. So this is like Fury. This is a 76 millimeter, but they normally had a 75 millimeter. Okay. 49,234 tanks were built during the war. The main armament was a 75 millimeter gun, later upgraded to a 76. Cost, 33,500 apiece. If you want to see a, an example of a Sherman, go out in front of the West Point Museum. There's one out in front. A perfect example. May 12th, Africa Corps is wrapped up and they're out of North Africa. All of North Africa is Clear now. Now what next? But until then, there's other things to take care of. I wanted to focus on this one Black May. Notice I left a blank. All right. Now at this time, with the U-boat campaign going on at full force, U-boats of course are submarines. Germany had something like 300 U-boats going forth, going back, and sitting in their bases. This month was the worst month. After this, they went on the defensive. No longer were they the hunter. They were the hunted. Out of 300, guess how many were lost in that one month of May? 150? Nope. 40. That's not bad. That's not bad. And it would get worse. Carl Dernens, the commander of the U-boats, brought them all back and said, we got to reassess. Something's going wrong. Yeah, the tide's turning. And then, of course, we have here the Enigma machine. And then, of course, we have the Ultra. And this is Alan Turing. This I took from the imitation game because it just fit my program. I don't know if anybody saw that movie. I'd recommend it. I knew it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he did a great job in it, too. Oh my God, you know. And the equivalent in the Pacific to read the codes of what the Japanese are doing, it was known as magic. Current Tax Payment Act of 1943 reintroduced the requirement to withhold income tax in the United States. Tax withholding had been introduced in the Tariff Act of 1913, but repealed by the Income Tax Act of 1916. The current Payment Act compelled employers to withhold federal income taxes from workers' paychecks and pay them directly to the government on the workers' behalf. At the time of the Act, the Social Security payments and World War II victory tax were already being withheld. Now, I gotta pause for a second because think about it. Revenue Acts 
war bond drives, and victory taxes. This is how the Roosevelt how Roosevelt and his administration funded and won the war. That's how you do it. All right, you get the people behind you. Now let's for a moment fast forward to 2001 and 2003. Tell me, how did that administration pay for its war? Credit card, put it on the card. That's what happened. All right, here we have the Allies invade Sicily. They have the forces necessary, they're going to move into Sicily. Once Sicily's wrapped up, then the Allies invade Salerno, right here, okay? The British 8th Army is moving up through this way, and then they land here. Italy's out of the war. Now, in late December of that year, a line was created that was known as the Gusta Line. All right, and that line, to be a little bit more accurate, I would say probably ran between. Let's see, between here and here, and it held up the Allies forever, as you can see, the next four months. So, what the Allies came up with an idea. They're going to do an amphibious invasion around the Gusta line and land at a port city called Anzio. This invasion was a failure due to the indecisiveness of the leader, Major General Lucas. Anzio, Anzio became known as the largest POW camp in Europe. The German forces contained an invading contained the invading Allied forces and maintained the Gusta line. This is a gun that I don't know if anybody of you, any of you, been to Aberdeen Proving Grounds. All right. Well, there's a picture there. Oh, really? Good show. This is Leopold, otherwise known as Anzio Annie. This was the gun that would fire down on the Allies sitting on the Anzio Beach, at, not doing anything. The Gusta line finally was broken on May 11th. And this is important because during the battle, there was a fortress, or there was a mountain, and there was an abbey on it called Casino, Monte Casino. All right. And they tried to take that mountain four times. I would say it's around here, actually. All right. They tried to take it four times. On the fourth time, they actually took it. Now, when I visited Poland, on my first day there, my daughter and I and my niece were leaving the hotel, all right? And there, there's singing going on in the lobby. So we get there a little bit late, and the elderly gentleman walks off out onto the road, out onto the street and all. And I'm like, what happened? Oh, he was one of the veterans of the Monte Casino. He's one of the Polish that actually took the mountain, and I ran out and got his picture. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah. That was so cool. I was so happy to do that. So, the open city, the Germans left Rome alone. Open city of Rome was captured by the Allies June 4th. What's going to happen in two days' time? Right, next page, D-Day, exactly. Who can tell me what the D in D-Day stands for? Day, Day-Day, that's what it stands for. That's what, it, that's what it stood for. You know? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out some of these. There we go. I'll of course move these back for the next time around. There we go. There we go. 
sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Can we get one back to Sandy then? I know she'd love to see this. Yep. Thank you. And Rebecca, would you like one? Uh, You're good? Okay, cool. All right, everybody's got one. Good, good, good. All right. Now, troop deployments. This is the significance of the Russian forces. Down below here is the troop deployments as of July 1st, 1943. Look at how many divisions were soaked up by attacking and defending against the Soviets, 175. Russians are playing a major part in this war, but it's not over yet. Now, I, my heading on this paper is, was it necessary? Was D-Day necessary? By June of 1944, the Germans had 58 divisions occupying the Low Countries, Belgium, and France. Look at that. All along here. All along. 58 divisions, okay? Even some divisions down here. Soviets were tying down 228 divisions. Pretty big. Operation Bagration launched 16 days after D Day. On June 22, 1944, the Soviet offensive consisted of 2.4 million troops supported by 36,400 artillery, 5,200 tanks, 5,300 aircraft against German Army Group Center, which numbered 700,000 men, 900 tanks, and 1,350 aircraft. In nine months' time, the Soviet forces annihilated 17 German divisions and reduced another 50 to half strength. Net losses, 42 divisions. Bagration forced the Germans to redeploy. Net loss, 42 divisions, sorry. Bagration forced the Germans to redeploy 46 divisions, some coming from France, pulling them away from the Allies just to stop the Soviet juggernaut coming from the other side. So, some say, well, let the Soviets do it. They're on a roll. Why do we have to land? And then some say, well, they won World War II in Europe anyway. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's nonsense. Now, if you would flip your sheets. Yep, the D-Day sheet there, sir. Right there. Here's a little backstory on that. Lend lease to the Soviet Union. General Gorgi Zhukov said the following after World War II. He was the premier Soviet general that saved Stalin's butt numerous times. Now they say the Allies never helped us, but it can't be denied that the Americans gave us so many goods without which we wouldn't have been able to form our reserves and continue the war. We didn't have enough explosives or gunpowder. We didn't have anything to charge our rifle cartridges with. The Americans really saved us with their gunpowder and explosives. And how much sheet steel did they give us? How could we have produced our tanks without American steel? But now they made it make it seem as if we had an abundance of all that. Without American trucks, we wouldn't have had anything to pull our artillery with. More on the lend lease. Aid went far beyond just sending tanks, planes, bullets, and bombs, however. Lend lease also provided everything from trucks, cars, railroad equipment, industrial aid, radios, gasoline, food, footwear. Dodge trucks were used, were as just as critical as T-34 tanks on the Eastern Front. And while the Soviet soldiers marched all the way to Berlin, they did the, they did so wearing boots courtesy of Uncle Sam. In total, there was roughly 17.5 million tons of military equipment, 
vehicles and industrial supplies and food were shipped from the Western Hemisphere to the USSR, 94% coming from the USA. So, you see where I'm going with this? I have a little bit more, but I just wanted to show you. The Soviets couldn't have done it without us. I'm telling you right now. While many years later, Soviet historians would later play down the importance of Lend-Lease in keeping the Soviet Union in the war, today multiple historians on both sides of the war credit the role it played. So, here's the reason why I feel it was necessary. We told the French we were coming, so we gotta, you know, we gotta stick to our guns. A deal to deal. We told Uncle Joe that we're, we're gonna give him a second front, all right? And the biggest reason why we had to go is this. Could we trust the Soviets to stop at their designated treaty lines? We have to go, whether we like it or not, we gotta go. That's the reason. All right. At this time, you saw this board before, Mike. Okay. Oh, you know what I wanna put that up right in there. This board is the Normandy area of where they landed. And actually, right here on this big map is the Normandy area. See that? Right there. We landed right there. Okay. Field Marshal Orwin Rommel was in charge of the entire occupied coast facing England. From Denmark to the Brittany coast, he had 34 infantry divisions, 7 panzer divisions, which are tanks, basically, under his command. The Allied forces consisted of six infantry and three airborne divisions. Some 176,000 men landed in 24 hours' time. What a feat. They were transported by 4,000 ships, escorted by 600 warships, 9,500 of aircraft of all types provided air cover for the operation. Now, before I exactly explain exactly where everybody landed, this beach is Omaha Beach, all right? It suffered the greatest casualties, and I'll go more on that in a little while. There was a bombardment. All these beaches were bombarded by the naval warships off the coast. How long do you think this naval bombardment lasted before it was turned off? Give me a guess, anybody. <clears throat> 20 minutes. That's it, 20 minutes. And it was mainly by destroyers, smaller ships. I'll explain that later when we talk about naval battles. But anyway, it was just so small. And then the air attack to bombard and soften up the beaches dropped them too far inland because when they finally showed up, they were worried about hitting the landing craft headed towards Omaha Beach. Thus, a major debacle. The 4th U.S. Infantry Division would land here at Utah Beach also accompanied by the airborne divisions 82nd and 101st would be scattered all around here okay so that helped out the fourth get on board and get in land quickly the rangers would land with uh, elements of the rangers would land with the elements of the 29th and the entire u.s first big red one division would land at omaha Here's an example of where the other rangers landed. Point du Hoc. That's really cool. They tried to take out these guns, and when they got there, they weren't there. But they scaled the cliffs and they took the position. The guns were further inland. The, um, let's see now, the British 50th would land here at Gold. The Canadians would land here at Juneau. That was the third division. And the British division, third, again, Canadian and British 3rd landed here at Sword Beach. And the British 6th Airborne would land over the Orne Canal to try to cover its flank. Beautiful execution. Now, the 
bluff. Look at that. Here's the actual invading forces. Here's the actual bluff hill, call it whatever you want, that they had to scale. When my wife and I went there in 96, she took a picture of me with the bluff behind me. And when you go there, you'll say, why did you ever even think of landing here? It was amazing. So they did it. They found a way. The destroyers actually helped the Americans landing by coming up so close to the coast. These are warships with only five inch guns. Bombarding the targets along the way, helping the Americans and the divisions get off the beach. Does anybody, how many of you have seen Longest Day? Okay, and you heard this sound, right? This is what you would, this is what the airborne would carry. And I got this at Normandy. And then when you hear the click back, then you know it's a fellow airborne guy. So that was really cool. Here is an actual piece of a German fortification. Mm. All right, you can just pick them apart. The fortifications are still there today. All right. limp tooth you know and the, it's wild because the fortifications and Sandy you want to just take a peek at that yeah, yeah the fortifications were at like 45 degree angle. So when the troops landed, the fortifications were like this, firing on their sides and not facing that way so the ships can just blast them head on. And the Germans had it figured out. But it was a fortress without a roof. And then before, <laughs> before Tom Sizemore did it in Saving Private Ryan, I did it, so I'm taking credit. This is actual sand from Omaha Beach. Mm. Isn't that cool? Mm. And I smuggled it back in a Advil bottle. <laughs> Now there was a couple of, there was a battery of four guns in between Omaha and Gold Beach. And this is where one of the guns stood. I got my picture in front of that too. Yeah. Love that, that was so cool. And then finally, the breakout occurs on July 26th. They landed June 6th and it took them a month, almost two months to break out from this area right here. Meanwhile, the Russians are just pounding them on the Russian front. All right. June 15th, bombing campaign now. I don't have a B-29, but um, we have a picture of a B-29. I, this is a picture of mine that I actually took of it flying down at the Reading Air Show down in Reading, Pennsylvania. There's like about three of these left in the world that can actually fly, which is pretty cool. So they started bombing, they're bombing Japan out of American bases in China. And this wasn't really that successful. So what they needed to do was get a base closer. And that's where the Battle of the Philippine Sea takes place. They needed the Marianas Islands. The Marianas Islands are right here. Saipan, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, right? Which is a lot closer to Japan. 
Now it's been 20 months since the last aircraft carrier battle was fought. Japan at this time was suffering from a severe shortage of fuel. This is mainly due to the crippling U.S. submarine campaign, which I will cover later. Against the Japanese merchant and tanker shipping, throw in an occasional warship loss or two, the Japanese needed time to restock for when their navy would really be needed. That time came when the U.S. invaded the island of Saipan on June 15, 1944. I'm going to explain this battle the best I can. Uh, so, I should have went over there first. Yeah. What I'm going to do is show you exactly where the Battle of the Philippine Sea is taking place. Here is the Philippine Islands, all right? And Americans have landed in Saipan. So immediately, Japan's going to launch their fleet from over here, based over here, and head towards the American fleet. Now, the Japanese had a range advantage. Like most Japanese cars today have a range gas, gasoline advantage over us. So their range advantage was 210 miles. So Japan could stand off at a great distance, all right, and launch their aircraft. Now, at the time, America didn't really know what was happening or where they were, but they knew the Japanese had to react because the Marianas had to be taken. So here's the situation. I showed you the Japanese are down by the Philippines and we're up by the Marianas Islands. We have 902 carrier based aircraft. Okay. They have 450. We have 15 aircraft carriers, eight of them being minor, you know, ma you know, escort carriers, not, not escort carriers, light carriers. Okay. Japan had, as you can see, nine aircraft carriers. It's all spelled out right here. So the Americans are just sitting back waiting for the Japan to attack. So Admiral Spruance decides he's going to send out his battleships. He's got seven battleships with Admiral Lee of Guadalcanal fame. And he sends them out like here with some cruisers and whatnot as a screen. Now, if you remember, Japan suffered great air losses in the Battle of Guadalcanal over those nine months of fighting there. So their replacement crews weren't that experienced. Okay. So Ozawa finds the Americans first, and it's like, we're going to launch a strike. So they launched a strike, and while this was going on, a pesky little submarine called the USS Albacore. There's this carrier there. He didn't know it was an armored flight deck. That's unheard of at this time. This is a brand new carrier to replace the four carriers that they lost in the Battle of Midway. He torpedoes it. All right. And while the torpedoes were headed in, one of the pilots of the Japanese that took off actually flew into the torpedo, one of the torpedoes, to try to take it out and save its ship, mm. save its mother ship. Oh, yeah, it actually happened. Didn't save the ship. Ship wasn't sunk yet, but it, due to the poor fuel supplies in Borneo, gases filled the entire ship, just waiting for problems to happen later on. So the f strike force comes up, and it comes across Admiral Lee and his seven battleships. And then the battle starts. What Raymond Spruance did was he launched a combat air patrol of his fighters and circled Admiral Lee, thus beginning a battle that was incredible. Here's an example of a 40, 40 millimeter anti aircraft shell. All right, it's a dummy. Okay, and that's why the whole one didn't want that. But that's what would be fired at the Japanese. Tons of aircraft were shot down. The carrier fleet was safe. Only one hit on a battleship. That's it. That's it. So then th they launch another strike. So some of the aircraft are headed back towards the carriers. Some are headed towards Guam because that was the plan. We're going to send the aircraft. We're going to launch them at a greater distance and then Guam's right next door. We'll land them on Guam. Well, that never happened because Guam was getting attacked by American aircraft and those fields were done. 
while some of these aircraft were coming back, another pesky submarine, American submarine, the Kavala, all right, takes out the Shokaku, one of the carriers that attacked us at Pearl Harbor and whatnot. Meanwhile, and a spark goes off, takes out that carrier. The whole carrier is filled with fire and it's, just, it's over. So another strike's headed this way. And, of course, the cap takes it out. Combat Air Patrol. Ozawa has had enough. Now, America doesn't, still doesn't know. Okay, it's got reports, but the Japanese are leaving. They're headed back towards Japan. Okay. So, it's up to Spruance to say, all right, what are we going to do? We can launch a strike. We have to find the fleet. He finds the fleet, but it's late in the day of the next day. So it's like, do I launch or do I not launch? Because the flyers will have to land at night. And that's unheard of in carrier operations at, at this time in the war. So he launches and he attacks and he sinks a light carrier and two oilers. The crew flies back on their way back. Spruin says, you know what? Turn on the carrier lights. Unheard of unheard of because it's going to light up the entire fleet any Japanese submarine around is going to have a beautiful day at it nothing happened at the conclusion of this battle known as the Battle of Philippine Sea it was known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot because some 415 Japanese aircraft were shot down yes for America's losses of 130 Carrier-based aircraft, 82 of them because they ditched in the dark. So what a grand victory. A damage on a battleship, which it's not a problem, for a loss of all of that Japanese air power and those air crews. At this time, napalm was used for the first time on the island of Tinian. Back in Europe. Everyone knows who he is because it's spelled out for everyone, but still, it's Audie Murphy, and those are all his awards he won during the war. Incredible. What a hero. Too many heroes to count. Back in the Pacific. There's an island chain called the Palau Group. And there's this one island specifically attacked by the American 1st Marine Division. And it was a bloodbath. It's all covered in this book. Uh, Eugene Sledge covers it in this book. It was on the books, so it had to happen. Even though the war progressed a lot better than both MacArthur and Nimitz thought it would. What was the original plan was to invade Mindanao, the southernmost island in the Philippine chain. But they figured, let's bring it up a notch. So they needed this supposedly as a land-based for their aircraft. By the time they went and attacked there, confusing things a little bit, sorry about that, they um, landed on this island. They eventually took it, but it wasn't necessarily needed later on because Nimitz had, no, actually, MacArthur had his own personal air force known as the Seventh Fleet. Now, some of the items that were taken as souvenirs on Pelelo. We have. There we go. Isn't that cool? Right. And we got a little Japanese battle flag. And then, real prize possession. Long sword, 
That's the short one. Here we have the katana. Now this, I bought this in Philly. It's fake. See that? There you go. So it's no big deal. But still, it was a you know cool samurai sword. So, so those were sought after prizes of the American Marines. This book covers something else that they one guy tried to bring back on a ship, and I'm not gonna tell you about that. But uh, it was like, get that out of here. <laughs> So anyway, then we move on to Operation Market Garden. And that operation was dreamt up by Field Marshal Montgomery, the English general. And it included two American airborne divisions. They took their objectives hard to show on this map, but it was cross they're trying to cross the Rhine, okay, and it failed short, but America played its part in it and held their objectives. Now, the next battle, Pacific, Battle of Lake Gulf. I'm going to show you this one in detail. back to the Pacific Island of Philippines. Here we have Central Philippines. This is, I've, like I mentioned before, Mindanao, all right? And here's Leyte. So right now, the Americans are going to land at Leyte Gulf. And of course, it's gonna invoke or provoke a Japanese reaction. Seventh Fleet is based down here. MacArthur's personal fleet. 18 escort carriers, and I'll explain escort carriers in a second. This plan was really complex, but this is practically the only plan that Japan actually, it, it worked for. So, out from Borneo comes Kurita and his heavy battleship force. Two of these ships, sisters, Yamato and Musashi, okay? So he's coming out this way. Meanwhile, from Japan, a guy named Shima is coming along this way. So is Nishimura coming from Borneo. But, of course, Nishimura gets here first. All right? Comes up through Surigao Street like this. With Shima following closely behind. The force is involved in these operations. Nishimura, two battleships, some cruisers. Nothing really of great strength because a lot of it's lost. And, of course, down here, Shima... Couple of heavy cruisers, no big deal. But they were supposed to coordinate all of this together. And, you know, after the first punch in a boxing match, it, all plans go to hell, right? So what happens here is Admiral Halsey with his third fleet is off Samar Island, all right? And he spots Karita coming around, snaking through the Philippines and blasts him. The sister ship of this ship right here is sunk. It was just found like maybe like back in 2012. Yeah. So Karita's had enough and he's starting to head back. Meanwhile, Jesse Ollendorf, an admiral under Kincaid down here in the Seventh Fleet, sets up a force of old battleships. Remember the yellow dots over those battleships? They were here. So were other ships from the European theater, all lined up along waiting for Nishimura and Shima to come on up. Take, we're gonna, take them on. Blasted. Now on the way up, they were harassed by PT boats. Example of a PT boat, go to Kingston, there's a PT boat hulls along the Rondau. Okay. And then further up, destroyers, destroyer squadrons attacking. And then they run into Jesse Ollendorf's force totally stops them from ever entering Leyte Gulf, okay? Then, the other plan to pull Halsey away, and this, this was just a brilliant plan, Ozawa of Philippine Sea fame, he's got like four carriers left, the rest of them, they can't even have enough fuel to send them out. 
he sails out here and when Halsey found out that there's carriers up there in the north he's like it's like saying a squirrel to a dog he's like I find, oh I gotta go so he takes his third fleet and heads on up against the Japanese leaving the San Bernardino Strait wide open now Corita says all right you know what we're gonna do we're gonna come back we're gonna give it the tr another try now Halsey knows this is happening but he's like I'll take a calculated risk because what's left behind is a tappy small little group of ships destroyer escorts destroyers and escort carriers six of them and they were just on anti-submarine patrol so they really didn't have any to fight actual Japanese major warships okay so when Karita comes sailing out of here and starts headed down here towards the Taffy 3 he's like wow this has to be a trap this is too easy okay and it's like okay let's keep going and these brave souls covered in the book that I recommend more than any book ever when it comes to World War II is this one right here it's my favorite book I ever read I used to give these away, but I can't find any more copies because I'm talking too much about them. So <clears throat> these brave souls, the escort carriers, and an example of an escort carrier English called them Woolworth carriers. They were also known as Jeep carriers, one torpedo ships, or Kaiser coffins. Ernie Pyle, everybody has heard of, great correspondent, described landing on an aircraft on one of these like this. It was like landing on a half a block of Main Street while a combined hurricane and earthquake, earthquake was going on. Yeah, it's crazy. So these tiny little ships, meanwhile, things like this are bearing down on the tiny little ships. Perfect example of a destroyer escort is up in Albany, the Slater. Okay. Yeah. He's going there with the Cub Scouts there. Wow. You're going to love it. You're going to say, that little ship took on this thing? Yes. Yes, it did. They ran headlong, firing their torpedoes, firing their little gun, trying to stop the, American, or the Japanese fleet from bearing down on the escort carriers, which was their objective. Now, just to give you an idea of what the Americans faced, Now, I created these things called barrel diameter inserts. You can actually take this and actually stick it inside the barrel of a gun. Okay? This is the Amato's six inch barrel. These little guns right here. All right? They were bearing down on the Americans. Six inch. <coughs> Heavy cruiser, Chokai, eight inch gun. Gonna get bigger. <laughs> Japanese battleship Haruna. Look at that. 14 inch gun. Yeah. That second battleship on your page here, that's the Nagato. Here's a perfect example of what was facing what. This is the Nagato. Oh my god. 16 inch gun. Fit this right in the barrel perfectly. That's what was blasting away at the Americans. Then, of course, these guns couldn't fit in the pizza box. The model. Yeah. 18 inch. All right. Now, the Americans, with their guns, where's the American gun now? I'm using it as a coaster. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. Look at that. That's what America faced <clears throat> these kind of guns. All right? But they fought them off. They, they were blasted. The Americans were, you know, they were just, a lot of them were sunk. They only had like four destroyers and three es destroyer escorts. They lost one of the 
escort carriers called the Gambier Bay. Somehow I found this pin in my travels. All right, Gambier Bay. But they stopped them. Carita said, you know what? This is way too easy. They're practically spilling into Leyte Gulf. All right. Watch this. Here we go. They're practically spilling into here, and then they turn around. Just like that. And they head back towards here. Meanwhile, it's like, everybody's like, Halsey, where are you? Well, I'm chasing carriers. Mm. <laughs> it's like, he caught hell for that. But he got his carriers. He sunk all four carriers. Just to pause for a second, World War II surrounds us, if you think about it. The torpedo in New Paltz, the PT boat hulls in Kingston, the Slater up in Albany, the Sherman tank outside West Point, and the Intrepid down in New York City. See, all these things, World War II. And the veterans. Yes, and the veterans. Especially the veterans. Thank you for bringing that up. Here we have our greatest pilot of all time, Richard Bond. Flew a P-38. Guess how many planes he shot down in his career? 40. Not bad. Battle of the Bulge. Another failed, desperate attempt for victory. Germany launches an offensive outside of the Ardennes Forest in Belgium. They get nowhere. Americans stop them cold. And of course, you heard about Bastogne and how they held out. It was awesome. Back to the Pacific. And we have Iwo Jima. Notice, this is very important because if we own the Marianas Islands, okay, if we own the Marianas Islands, then what we have to do is take Iwo Jima and then any of our airmen, when they start bombing Japan, need a base closer, they could just land on Iwo Jima, which is cool. Plus, it provided fighter support of the bombers flying from the Marianas over to Japan itself. John Barcelona of Guadalcanal fame couldn't stay home. He lands on Iwo Jima, first day, dead. Medal of Honor winner. Couldn't stay home. He had it all. Nimitz would quote, uncommon valor was a common virtue. 22 medals of honor would be given out on that island. Back to Europe. Bridget Remagen. They crossed the Rhine. The Americans crossed the Rhine. This is a little skewed and whatnot, but the Americans were the first to cross the Rhine. Again. Okinawa. We're closing in. Here we have Okinawa right here. So close to Japan. Okinawa took three months to take. The northern three quarters of the island took three weeks. The north, the southern quarter of the island took three months. And at that time, back on the 7th of April, 1941, the Yamato and a Light cruiser and some destroyers sailed out from Japan to beach itself on the island and help out the Japanese. Well, you know it didn't get there. And we'll, I'll, I'll show you a picture of how it not got there later on. Europe. Americans liberate the concentration camps of Buchenwald on April 11th, Dachau on April 29th, and Mauthausen on May 5th. And they surrender unconditionally on May 7th. Now, I want to pause for a second because I've got to give kudos to General Eisenhower. When he and his forces found out what was going on, he knew later on in life there's going to be deniers. And he's like, that's not going to happen on my watch. I'm going to videotape everything and it's going to be documented for the rest of time. God bless him for doing that. Back into the Pacific, the bombing campaign. Got a little another visual. I love my visuals. 
Now, in August, the war was wrapping up. The armistice would be signed on the 15th. And the average monthly bombing average was 34,402 bombs. Tons, tons, sorry, tons. Okay, that was in August. Now, this is a projection. If Japan was to continue on with their hijinks, then in September 41, or 45, 100,000 tons. Just a month later. All right? And if they kept going, some 4,000 bombers would be based on the ok Okinawa and the Marianas Islands. British and American aircraft deploying from Europe. This is the projection. Look at that, 170,000 tons. And if they kept going, by the time the planned coronet invasion of 1946, look at that, 200,000 tons of bombs. General Curtis LeMay, the man in charge of this campaign, said, another six months and Japan would have been beaten back into the dark ages, which practically was the case anyhow. Kudos to the American Air Force. All right, as you can see here, this is a picture I took out of a, um, in a museum up in Massachusetts. It's closed right now, but this is Japanese koku. It was fused together by 5,400 degrees temperature from the bomb being dropped. I read a story about a Japanese survivor named Futaba Kitayama. She attempted to wipe the blood away from her face after the bomb, only to find out she was wiping the skin off of her face. Yeah. In the last weeks of the war, the 20th Air Force based on the Marianas Islands began waging a new and devastating form of psychological warfare. The superforts began calling their shots. They would drop leaflets over cities to be hit, warning the population to evacuate or else, and then return one or two days later and completely destroy it. And that's with the bull, you get the horns. Who can name me the B-29 that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. No. Okay. There you go. Very good. Yeah. And what was the name of the bomb that they dropped? No. Close. Little boy. Yeah. There you go. And what was the name of the B-29 that dropped the bomb on Nagasaki? Now, this is a little far out in the weeds. That was known as Boxcar, B-O-C-K-S-K-A-R. And the name of the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was... Equal. Batman. Batman. <laughs> All right. Now, I want to show you something here. Chase, can I borrow you a second? Cool. <laughs> All right, come on over here. Stand over here. Here's, we're going to have a little picture explanation time. Well, you know what this is? Uh, Kamikaze headband. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't have the dot, but it's close enough. Okay, it's not a real one. Now, here we have, if you would hold this up. Oh, you want to be in the picture? Come around the side. No, 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 come around. There you go. Here we go. And I'll show this to you guys in a second, okay? You're not going to miss out. Okay, here we have the fear of a kamikaze right in your grill, okay? You know what? Maybe we should go behind. Maybe that would be better. Come on behind here. And then we can show everybody. Here we go. There we go. Now just slip on in there. That's okay. Don't worry about it. That's okay. I always make a new one, and I have to, at least every time I do this. Okay, now everybody can see, right? There we go. Kamikaze, right in your grill. 
The effects of a kamikaze, lower left-hand corner, that's the hit on the St. Lowe, one of the carriers, one of the escort carriers in Tappy 3. All right. That ship, they never rename a ship that was originally named USS Midway. And they're like, wait a minute, we got a fleet carrier. Why don't we call it the St. Law? Everybody's like, I want off of the ship. There you go. You don't rename a ship in the war. So I got hit by a kamikaze and sunk. Here we have the um, last of the Pearl Harbor carriers that attacked us, the Zui Kaku. Okay. I'll show you these in a second here. And they're on their way out. And I love this guy because he's saluting. I just love that picture. Over there is a picture from the USS Nautilus. Again, the pesky U.S. subs. All right. Taking a picture of sinking the destroyer Yamakaze. It's got the big red meatball on the turret and whatnot. Here's a carrier over here on the, yeah, very good. That was called the Amagi. Never made it into battle. Americans caught it in the harbor, didn't have enough fuel, couldn't go anywhere, didn't have the air crew sunk. And over here, remember I talked about the Amato trying to beach itself on Okinawa? Well, look what the Americans did to that thing. Blasted it in half. Didn't have a prayer. And then here, all these pictures are, are locations of Japanese ship losses due to the Americans in the Pacific. It's amazing. Sub, surface, air, everything. Everything included. Every location of everything. And then, of course, here's my daughter. Back in 2010, we visited uh, Washington, D.C. and the uh, Iwo Jima Memorial. You know? Thank you, Chase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll stop this for a minute. Good show. Give a big hand to Chase. <laughs> All right. Okay. And then we have, just in regards to the silent service, the U.S. subs, they made up 1.6% of the U.S. Navy. 1.6%. Ready for this? They sunk, contributed to... 51 to 56 percent of all Japanese shipping losses in the war. Silent service. And one of our greatest, our greatest subcommander, Richard O'Kane, this man, sank 31 ships in five war patrols. Amazing. Then of course, here we have, I picked this up at Pearl. Here's the article of surrender from Japan. Oh, nice. Conditionally, mind you, they held on to their emperor, not like Germany, unconditionally. All right. That concludes my presentation. Okay.